Father, we thank you for the day that we've had. We thank you for watching over us, keeping us safe. Thank you once again for food and drink and clothes to wear and homes to live in, family and friends. We have so much to thank you for. And we come to you this evening as a grateful people, uh, thanking you not only for this wonderful world that you have made and your wonderful love to us, but uh, demonstrating that most of all in sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We meet in his name. We thank you for him. Uh, we worship you because uh, you sent uh, the Son whom you loved to die for us. And Lord, we can never really get over that, that you would love us uh, so sinful, so wretched, that you would love us so much that you would ask your Son to leave heaven and uh, come to be a man in this world, uh, to live in the constraints of a human body, to put up with people and their silliness and their pettiness and their sinfulness and allow wicked men to take him uh, and put him on a cross. We thank you that you did that, Lord, for us. Uh, we are overwhelmed when we consider your love for us. And we ask that you would help us in turn to be a humble and grateful and thankful people. We meet around your word and we thank you that you haven't uh, left us without a witness. We thank you for the Holy Spirit and his work coming to us. But we know that the Spirit works through the word. And so as we read your word tonight and as we consider it together, Holy Spirit, we pray, teach us and bless us and help us to understand the things we read and the things that we'll consider tonight. So we commit our meeting, Lord God, into your hands. We pray for your blessing. We pray for a real sense of your presence. And we ask now for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to uh, look at uh, the fifth in the series of the Twelve, uh, as uh, I'm now calling them, uh, Twelve uh, Prophets. Um, and, uh, and the reason for that, as I, I've said, is I want to look at them in the order that they were written, as far as I can ascertain what that is. And uh, one can't be too dogmatic about it. Commentators all have their different views. Um, but looking at it in the way that we are, uh, we are going to um, see, hopefully, a thread uh, that goes through that. And uh, by way of recap, we, we first looked at Obadiah, uh, warning in, uh, Edom for its sin against Judah, uh, which is the first book. Uh, and from that we noted a phrase that he uses, the day of the Lord. Uh, that phrase is picked up and expanded by Joel, um, the next of the twelve, as he warns God's people of judgment, but he also pleads them to repent uh, using this um, image of the locust. Um, and then at the end of his phrase, uh, he talks about the lion that will roar, uh, which in Amos, the third book, uh, is more or less the text of the book. The lion is roaring in, in Amos. He has uh, a lawsuit uh, against Israel, is a charge against Israel. It's one of the types of oracles that the prophets use. We think about judgment oracles, salvation oracles, but this one of the lawsuit is, is one of the big ones. And as we uh, saw uh, last time at the end of his book, Amos declares, and James picks it up and quotes Amos in Acts 15, verse 12 to 18, that it was always God's plan to bring Gentiles into the kingdom. And uh, for many Israelites and, and uh, later on for many Jews, this is something that they just could not or would not get their hands uh, uh, around, their heads around rather. Um, and partly it's because of their unfaithfulness and their idolatry. Um, and then we have Jonah illustrating that point that Amos makes. Um, John, Jonah is the fourth book, um, and he's a picture of how Gentiles are saved. Um, he's a reluctant, hostile prophet, but we learn through Jonah that is through the foolishness of the word preached that repentance and forgiveness was granted to the Gentiles. And on the face of it, um, although it's it's probably implied that Jonah must have told them about the, the flood and so on because Jesus says that his life was a sign to them. Nonetheless, the actual sermon that we have is eight words in English and five words in Hebrew. It was the, you know, the utter foolishness of preaching, yet 40 days Nineveh will be overthrown. But it is through the foolishness of the message preached that repentance was granted to the Gentiles. And then we learn, interestingly, that Jonah is angry, really angry with God for showing mercy to Gentiles. But God explains to him through the illustration of the good that withers that it's his prerogative to have mercy upon whom he wishes. And it wasn't, and it never was his plan for Israel to be exclusively his people. 
Gentiles have always been grafted in. Think of the line of the Lord Jesus Christ, for example, where you have Rahab and you have Ruth, uh, both who are not of Israel. Uh, and uh, now, in our day, as Joel prophesies, the floodgates are open for all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Jonah uh, is an illustration of God's grace to Gentiles, but more importantly, God's grace to the worst of Gentiles. So it's not nice Gentiles that are saved or religious Gentiles that are saved. It is the worst of Gentiles that are saved. Uh, and then 10 years or so after Amos comes the fifth book, which is Hosea. And Hosea is the first uh, li listed in the 12, but I estimate he's probably the fifth one that is written. And um, I don't know how often you've read the prophecy of Hosea. Um, it's said of the Song of Solomon that uh, Israelites were not allowed to read the book until they were 30 years old because of its explicit content. But I suggest to you that uh, reading through Hosea uh, is, is not an easy read uh, either um, because it is very uh, explicit. So Hosea is what we're going to plan to look at tonight. Uh, just to set it in date and time, um, Hosea says that he prophesies, this is quite interesting, if you turn to Hosea chapter 1 verse 1, we have uh, these words, the word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, or Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. And we've met Jeroboam before, um, and uh, he's the second Jeroboam, Jeroboam the second. Uh, he rules from about 793 to 752 BC, so he has a long reign it's about 40 41 years and interestingly um, the kings of judah that are listed from uzziah to hezekiah well that covers a time span of 790 roughly the same time jeroboam becomes king but hezekiah reigns until 686 bc so unless hosea was an extremely long living man um, uh, it's probable that he you know begins his prophecy towards the end of uzziah's uh, and uh, uh, Jeroboam's reign uh, and perhaps just dips into the start of Hezekiah's reign but what is interesting about verse 1 is that Hosea does not mention the kings that followed Jeroboam Jeroboam uh, dies around 6, 752 BC but uh, even if uh, Hosea prophesies to the beginning of Hezekiah's reign uh, which is um, about 715 BC it's still a long time uh, 35 to 40 years at least but what happens uh, by the time hezekiah is king as you as you'll probably know is that israel's gone there have been these loads and loads of kings that have happened in very quick succession we have zechariah shalom menahem pekahiah Pika, and hoshea they reign some as short as a few months um, but by the time of hezekiah's reign starting in 715 bc these kings have all come and gone uh, Israel has gone, Samaria is levelled, and Hosea actually prophesies and watches his prophecy comes true. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, an, it's quite an, a, a, a difficult uh, thing for him uh, that he has to go through. Uh, the exile of the north has taken place, you can read it in Two Kings. Um, they, they take all of the population out and they bring in pop, uh, people from other nations and mix the whole thing up, uh, which of course is why you have Samaritans in the time of the Lord Jesus, and it's also why they're hated, because they're, they're a mixed race. Yes, there's some Israelites there, but in the main, they are Gentiles. Uh, and it is quite possible that the reason that Hosea doesn't list these kings of Israel is because they were not anointed by God. One kills the next, and then is killed by the next, and it's a completely uh, horrific um, uh, set of uh, situations and I think that Hosea just refuses to recognise them. So it is probable, as we said, um, that Hosea begins to minister in the latter part of Jeroboam and Uzziah's reign, preaching about 40 years uh, until the beginning of Hezekiah. So you've got before um, Hosea, Amos and Jonah, as we've seen, and after him come Micah and Isaiah. Uh, so he's kind of the sandwich in the middle but it seems that he overlaps with all of these prophets it would have been interesting to know if they ever got together and, and uh, or whether they were part of the school of the prophets or the sons of the prophets that have been around in Elisha's time a few years earlier we, we just don't know the backdrop now 
to Hosea's ministry is this um, <coughs> rather frightening rising to power of Assyria. Uh, we, we know from the story of Nineveh uh, just how bloodthirsty and cruel uh, these uh, people uh, were. And uh, they begin to rise to power very quickly under Shalmaneser and Tilgaspaliza, and they, um, they come to be the dominant power uh, of their day. Uh, Keel writes, uh, and uh, it's quoted in another commentary, these rather serious words are about Israel, or at the north of ten tribes. Founded as it was in rebellion against the royal house of David, which God himself had chosen, the northern kingdom bore within itself from the very first the spirit of rebellion and revolution, and therefore the germs of self-destruction. Uh, the end comes very quickly. Uh, Jeroboam reigns a long time, 40, 40 plus years. Ten years later, Assyria begins to rise in power very suddenly, uh, and 30 years after Jeroboam has died, uh, Israel uh, is removed and taken away. So this is the concept, uh, this is the con context that uh, Hosea prophesies into. So who is Hosea? We, we don't know very much about him. Hosea 1 verse 1 just simply says, the word of the Lord that came to uh, Hosea, the son of, of Beeri or Beeri. Uh, and often when uh, the father is listed, it implies that he was somebody that people knew, that he was somebody important. We, we don't know, there's quite not, lots of interesting Jewish traditions about him. But in the end, we don't know. His name means salvation. Uh, you'll know, of course, that Joshua, who uh, witnessed to Moses, so served with Moses, uh, he was originally Oshia, uh, which means salvation, uh, and his name was changed by Moses to Joshua, uh, which means the Lord is salvation. Ironically, it's the name of the king, uh, the last king of Israel, who, of course, couldn't save his people. Uh, it is written of Hosea that he is the prophet with the broken heart. His commission was to plead for Israel to return to God. He probably preached for over 40 years, but all he sees is the people persisting in their stubborn resistance. The use of um, Aramaic phrases and the calling of the king of Israel, our king, in chapter 7, verse 5, leads most commentators to believe that he was uniquely uh, a prophet who hailed from the north and who preached to the north. Remember last time Amos uh, was from the south but was sent to preach to the north but here Hosea seems to live uh, in the north and the other th interesting thing as you read through his prophecy is that he calls Israel by several other names uh, he often refers to Israel as Samaria which is its capital uh, Jacob uh, its origin and Ephraim its largest tribe so if you read through that and wonder who he's talking about they're just other names for Israel and uh, his use of agriculture um, is picked up by a number of commentators who assume that he must have been a farmer or had some kind of farming background. So what was Hosea's message? If you read the 14 chapters of Hosea, what really is his book all about? Well, it is very important to spell out the background uh, to, to Hosea's ministry. Uh, as we said, he was preaching to Israel, the northern Ten tribes, in theory, of course, they were God's people, but it, since 931 they'd forsaken God, they'd worshipped golden calves, they'd worshipped Baal and Ashtoreth and the forbidden idols of the old inhabitants of the land. If you read 2 Kings 17, 5 to 23, when you get home, uh, there's a summary. It's almost like a commentary of Hosea's ministry, really. Um, it, it is absolutely appalling, the things that they get up to. And... Uh, God said, you know, says in 2 Kings 17, you know, I sent you prophets, I've given you warnings, but in the end, there was no remedy. There was no hope for them because they persisted in their sin. Um, one man writes, sad to say the land of Jehovah, the land wherein he dwelled, had become a land filled with idolatry, a land in which there was no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God, but swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, blood touching blood. Since Israel had defiled the land of Jehovah, the land was getting ready to spew them out as it had spewed out the wicked Canaanites. Such were the conditions when Hosea began to prophesy. Now the other thing to, to notice is that Israel was not a poor country. Um, it wasn't in destitution, it wasn't under famine. Um, it actually was a land of real plenty because Jeroboam, um, had been a very uh, successful military commander. He led his forces, 
He'd uh, defeated Syria. He'd even um, recaptured Damascus. And what that meant was that he had command of all the trade routes. And as I think we've mentioned before, uh, the caravans of traders, were, as they passed through a land, when they entered the borders, they had to pay a tax, a toll for, for doing so. And so whoever held that land had uh, money uh, coming in because the, 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 where that was, it was the only way to get from one place to the other. And so Israel were a rich country. There was a land of plenty, it's a land of prosperity, but it also is a land of pride. God was not remembered. God was not thanked for all uh, his goodness. Worse than that, they enslaved others. They, there was many poor people in the land. Uh, we read in one place that they were so poor they couldn't afford a pair of sandals. And so there is oppression, uh, there is pride, there is wickedness on just about every level. And so this is the situation to which uh, Hosea comes. Now if you turn to Hosea 1, we're not going to read all of it, uh, but we will read the first uh, few verses. It gives you a, a kind of flavour of where we are. Uh, so part 1 of Hosea is from 1 uh, verse 2 to 3 verse 5. And uh, in verse 2 of chapter 1, we read these words. When the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry. For the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. So he went and took Goma, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of, Je of Jehu, bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. It shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again and bore a daughter. Then God said to him, Call her name, her name Lo Ruhamah, for I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah, will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword or battle, by horses or horsemen. Now when she weaned, Lo Ruhamah, she conceived and bore a son. Then God said, Call his name Lo Amai, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Now, if you've never read the book of Hosea before, uh, it's quite a jaw dropping astonishment, isn't it? You know, that God says to his prophet, uh, I want you to go and marry a prostitute. And uh, this gives commentators a bit of a headache. Uh, how would God ever ask uh, his prophet to do such a thing? So is it an allegorical passage? And there are all sorts of incredible reasons that you can read why it has to be allegorical and all of that. But the simple fact is that it's a literal passage of scripture. The commands are literal. Uh, Goma is a real person. Her children are, are real children. They have names and all of those names mean something. So we can't get around that. But it was only... Uh, priests who were forbidden to marry a prostitute and since there's no evidence that Hosea was a priest he was free to marry her according to the law um, he was not responsible clearly for her behavior beforehand or afterwards but um, it's in a way no different to some of the things that Ezekiel had to do uh, when he was you know doing these kind of visual illustrations and so this is an illustration uh, of God saying to Israel um, you know as uh, Hosea, my prophet, is married this woman who is an unfaithful woman by, by behaviour. So you uh, are unfaithful to me. She was a walking picture, a walking visual aid, if you like. And so this was to give Israel a stark reminder of how God viewed their behaviour. He said to them, you are being unfaithful to me. You are supposed to be my people. Uh, and in fact, if you go home and read Ezekiel 16 and 23, you have exactly the same language that God is using. You have been unfaithful. Like an unfaithful wife, you are unfaithful. And so we read Hosea marries Gomer uh, and has a son called Jezreel. Uh, and God says, I want you to name him Jezreel uh, because uh, that means something also. And what it meant was is that the king of Israel, by now um, Shalom, uh, he kills Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam II. And uh, in doing so, he fulfilled the prophecy that God gave to Jehu. He said to Jehu, for what you have done in killing 
the uh, king of Israel and all of his family, Ahab and all of that, um, you will have a son to the fourth generation. And uh, uh, um, uh, the son of the king of Israel, Jeroboam's son, uh, was Zechariah. Now Shalom, as some of the other kings did, they kill him and he was sat on the throne. So he is prophesying what is going to happen um, before it happens. Uh, and then that's a picture, of course, that Israel are going to be taken away um, as uh, the whole house of Israel was before, the king of Israel was before. The second child was a girl, Lo Ruhama, and that means no mercy. And this was to signify that Israel would go into captivity and receive no mercy from God against Assyria. God was going to allow the Assyrians to come up and take it. And we read that in 2 Kings 17, that's exactly what he did. And then to emphasize this even more, a third child, this time a boy, was born and named Loami, which means not my people, signifying that God has rejected Israel. But the interesting thing about this book is that at the end of chapter 1, um, he talks about them coming back, uh, the restoration. And this cycle of judgment and restoration, what we might call judgment oracles, salvation oracles, promises of judgment, promises of salvation, they are uh, all throughout the book. They're quite cyclic um, around throughout the book. And then briefly in chapter 2, as Goma turns out to be unfaithful, God likens Israel's behaviour to that of an unfaithful wife. She tries not one lover, but many lovers, seeking to get satisfaction, but she cannot get what she wants, because God has prevented it. And so she decides to go back home. Nonetheless, God decrees punishment for her unfaithfulness before he promises mercy. The same picture again is given in chapter 3, when Hosea has to go and find his wife and buy her back. Uh, and once he has her home, he instructs her to stay there, and he alone will be her husband. And uh, it's a picture that God will, uh, in time, uh, take away the family of Israel, but they will, in time, uh, return to him. And so that is a kind of summary, really, of, of uh, chapters 1 to 3, this very vivid graphic picture of, of Israel's unfaithfulness, and yet God as the yearning husband wanting her to come back to him. Now we're going to have a look at uh, the second part, uh, which starts in chapter 4. So can I invite you to turn to chapter 4, and verse 1. And you'll, you'll know by now that this is, uh, as we read these verses, this is once again what we call uh, a lawsuit, this idea of the charge that God brings against Israel. So Hosea stands up and says, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. What is the charge? Well, there is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraint. With bloodshed upon bloodshed, therefore the land will mourn and everyone who dwells there will waste away. With the beasts of the field and the birds of the air, even the fish of the sea will be taken away. Now, let no man contend or rebuke another, for your people are like those who contend with the priest. Therefore you will stumble in the day. The prophet shall also stumble with you in the night, and I will destroy your mother. For my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you for being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. The more they increased, the more they sinned against me. I will change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people. They set their heart on their iniquity, and it shall be like people, like priest. So I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their deeds. For they shall eat, but not have enough. They shall commit harlotry, but not increase, because they have ceased obeying the Lord. And we could go on, but uh, it carries on really in much uh, the same vein. Now, I'm not, I can't prove this, but I'm going to make a, a guess that when Paul wrote the opening chapter of Romans, uh, he, had a, he had this book very much in mind. You'll see several of the phrases that Paul uses uh, have roots uh, here. Now, so this, this second part from chapter 4 to the end, most commentators will say this is one chapter. But I think that makes it too difficult to really understand and read as one. 
And uh, one commentary um, has, has makes it quite helpful that it, and breaks it down into three uh, parts. Uh, and so we have this, uh, this, this the, the judgment oracles, uh, salvation oracles, they kind of come and go, this repetitive, there's going to be judgment, but there'll be restoration. But um, essentially, the rest of the book is a lawsuit. God brings charges. And he brings three charges against uh, the people of Israel. The first charge is, uh, we, as we've read in chapter 4, uh, is a lack of knowledge and a rejection of knowledge. So the first charge against Israel is, you have rejected the knowledge that comes through my word. You've rejected my word. Um, and it has a parallel to Romans 1.28 where he says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And this is Israel uh, in Hosea's time. He, this is what he charges them with. You don't want to have anything to do with me. You know all about me. You know my word. You have my word. But you've turned it away. You've pushed it out. And so the first crime that led Israel into this unspeakable wickedness that we are thinking of here uh, in 4 verse 2 uh, but, you know, by swearing and lying and killing and stealing, committing adultery, they break all restraint. You just can't imagine what life was like in everyday Israel, can you? I mean, you know, we often complain about society now, but there, there would have been no police force, there would have been nobody to protect anyone, there was no restraint. You know, it was every man for himself. It must have been a terrible place to live in. And so the first crime that Hosea uh, charges Israel with is that uh, you have gone into unspeakable wickedness against your fellow man and idolatry against God. And he, he states the evidence, and as you read the book through, you'll see again and again, he talks about the idolatry of Israel, where they're offering sacrifices on mountaintops, um, and uh, all these, you know, uh, offering uh, all of these uh, different gods, uh, their incense and, and, and uh, all these sort of things. They go and speak to wooden idols and ask guidance from, from pieces of wood, and you have that... Incredible story in, in or, or little satire in Isaiah, don't you, where he says, you know, the, the man goes out one day and he chops down a piece of wood, put, chops down a tree, and he chops it in half, and one half he cuts up and makes his fire, and the other half he carves and makes it a god and says, you are the god that saved me, and all of that. And, and it's, it's bitter satire, but it's, it shows the ridiculousness uh, of what Israel were doing. And so... Uh, the evidence is, is there, the lawsuit is proved, and this pattern follows all the way through the rest of the book. But God uses this imagery of the yearning husband uh, throughout of this book, because uh, the point of sending the prophet, as the Ninevites understood very quickly, the whole point of sending a prophet is, God's given us another chance. He's given us a chance. And if you look at uh, chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, you have this very, very touching called to repentance God ends this section he says you know although you've pushed me out of the way and you've, you've rejected my knowledge and you won't have anything to do with me yet it's not over between us he says come and let us return to the Lord for he has torn but he will heal us he has stricken but he will bind us up after two days he will revive us on the third day he will raise us up that we may live in his sight let us know let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord is going forth, is establishes the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. And of course, whenever we see this kind of phrase, you know, on the third day we will rise again, you know, it, it reminds us, doesn't it, of the Lord Jesus. And it's a, it's a remarkable picture. And of course, as the Lord Jesus went through his ministry, he, he said on a number of occasions, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed, but on the third day he will rise again, pointing again to this book, of Hosea. Uh, why are you rising again? To bring my people back to repentance, to bring them so they may walk uh, and live in my sight, so, to save them as we would use the, uh, the New Testament parlance. And so although these people are a dead people, though these people are an afflicted people, afflicted by God, um, and obviously they're taken away by Assyria in the course of time, yet that's not the end. Uh, God says, I will bring you back. And so we have the second part of the lawsuit, which is the longest part, chapter 6, verse 4, to chapter 11, verse 11. And we're not going to, to read all of that section, uh, partly because there's uh, it's quite a, a similar picture to the opening uh, chapter. But uh, this lack of love um, 
which God demands. You remember he says, I am the Lord your God who has brought you up of the land of Egypt. You will have no other gods before me. What is he really saying there? He's saying, love me first. That's what he's saying. Uh, that first and foremost, you love me. But uh, of Ephraim, uh, we read in chapter 6, verse 4, What shall I do to you? O Judah, what shall I do to you? For your faithfulness is like a morning cloud. You know, it's like the mist that rises and then vanishes away. That's, that's your love for me. That's your fidelity to me. Uh, it goes away like the, the early dew. And uh, so God is uh, demonstrating, uh, sorry, remonstrating with his people, uh, saying that you have no love uh, for me. And, you know, in spite of me sending you many prophets, and the phrase there is these prophets give them a, a real tongue lashing. You know, I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of your mouth. He hasn't spared Israel. And, and as we've read the prophets and you see that there's some pretty straight talking going on. But what are the people saying? The people are clinging on to the fact that, you know, if we do the sacrifices, if we do all those things that, that God requires, then we will uh, be saved. And uh, that's what they're clinging on to. But in chapter 6, verse 6, uh, we read, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. You see, God is saying, you can't just live this life of, I get up in the morning, I sin as I want, and then before I go to bed, I offer some sacrifices to make it all right again. That's not a relationship with me. That's not what I'm asking you for. I'm asking for you to love me. And so loving me, you put me first. There's an example here in verse 8 of chapter 6, where we have Gilead is a city of evildoers and defiled with blood. Now, what's all that about? Well, as you may well know, Gilead was one of the designated cities of refuge. But Matthew Henry in his commentary says that uh, they would commit murder and then bribe the gates, uh, gatekeepers to let them in so that they couldn't be uh, tried and uh, brought to justice. And so in verse 7 we read, it was defiled uh, with blood. They were sowing the wind, chapter 8, verse 7, they were reaping the whirlwind. They thought that they could sin with impunity. They thought that they could get away with it. And isn't that a picture of society today and in any society in any day? People sin against God and their attitude is, I will get away with this. Um, I can do whatever I want. And it seems that Israel, far from loving God as they should have done, they were willing to love any other God. Uh, any other wicked practice, any other form of idolatry more than God. Why? Because they simply were much more fun. You know, you, they appealed to the flesh. You know, you could go and you could commit all of these uh, horrendous sins in the name of religion, uh, at the shrines and under the trees and all of the other places where they erected these uh, idol worship. And, and again, it's always been thus, isn't it? You know, um, even in the Roman Catholic Church, in many other churches, um, even in so-called evangelical uh, churches, sin is used as a cloak for religion. I can, can do this and it's absolutely <coughs> fine. Um, and they dress it up in some kind of religious language or some pious talk, but it's still sin. And God reminds them of who they are. And that's always a good thing for us, isn't it? You know, never forget where we came from. Never forget that we were sinners saved by a saviour. Uh, and he says to them uh, later on in chapter 8 that, you know, I found you. I found you destitute, uh, you know, in Egypt. But I rescued you. But no sooner had I rescued you than you uh, commit this wickedness in the, 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 the valley of Peor. You remember the story of Balaam trying to... Uh, be bribed by the king, um, uh, Balak, to um, curse the people. But he said, I can't. I can only sort of like speak what God says to me. And so he gives that up and instead he seduces them into uh, idolatry and adultery. And so they sin uh, and then uh, the cycle sort of begins uh, then. And it's not long before the golden calves and all of these other things that they do. And apart from the generation of Joshua, Israel constantly go back to sin but then we have this rather strange verse in chapter 11 verse 1 uh, and we know it of course because it's in the new testament but the context here when israel was a child i loved him and out of egypt i called my son as they called them so they went from them they sacrificed to the bales and burnt incense to carved images 
Now, it's, you know, it, it perplexes most scholars that this verse could ever be used and quoted in the New Testament because the, the context of it um, is that, uh, as we've said already, God, God found Israel, if you like, in Egypt. Um, you know, they, they were a nation then. He loved them. He took them out of Egypt. Um, and that part of the picture holds true of the Lord Jesus Christ. Clearly, he had to flee to Egypt, uh, just as I Israel had to flee to Egypt, or Jacob and his sons because of the famine. Um, but God loved him there and brought him out. And um, the picture is of the Lord Jesus, that he is loved by God and brought out uh, of Egypt. Now, again, at the end of this uh, cycle of, of uh, prophecies, of judgment, of oracles, salvation oracles, still as kind of part of this lawsuit, we read that God still yearns for Israel. In chapter 11, verse 8, he says also, the high, uh, the high, sorry, wrong chapter. Chapter 11, verse 8, how can I give you up, Ephraim? Which, as we said, is a, another name for Israel. How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I set you like Zeboim? My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come with terror. And so once again, you know, God is kind of stepping back, as it were, uh, from the precipice. Uh, he, he wants them back. And, and the words here, you know, if you're into kind of word studies and all of that, you know, have a look at these kind of words that he does. You know, my heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. But this idea of a churning heart, you know, it kind of reminds us almost of, of two teenagers meeting and not quite sure whether one loves the other and the one who's not quite sure, well, their heart is churned. You know, they, don't, they can't eat and they can't sleep. You know, does they, do they love me? Don't they love me? And God is like that. He's using the language of kind of teenage angst here to say, no, you know, I love you. you know, I want you back. I want your love exclusively for me. And we might think, well, why doesn't God just, you know, get rid of these people? You know, they're nothing but a, a nuisance. But he loves them. He wants them back. And he says, I am God and not man. My love doesn't change. Uh, and, you know, Paul says, doesn't he, you know, Jesus Christ yesterday, uh, today and forever. You know, he's the same. And God is the same. He's, a, he's God and not man. And so his love remains constant. But then uh, at the end of, of, of chapter 11, verse 12, uh, we have a third part of the lawsuit. And the third part, uh, we've said the first one was a, a lack of knowledge. Whereas the second one is a lack of love. And here we have a lack of faithfulness. And as you read from Ephraim, uh, sorry, from 11, uh, verse, chapter 11, verse 12 onwards, we read about Ephraim has encircled me with lies, the house of Israel with deceit. Uh, and so we have this idea of, of Ephraim playing fast and loose with God's love, you know, pretending to love him, but not really loving him. And uh, eventually God says, you know, I, I'm going to have to step in. You know, the, 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 the sin and the wickedness has got so bad that in chapter 12, verse uh, 7, uh, he likens them to cunning Canaanites because they have a deceitful scales uh, in his hand. He loves to oppress. The general pattern of behaviour is, I will do to you whatever I feel that I can get away with. And so God says uh, that I'm going to strip your wealth away. I'm going to return you to the poverty that you had in the wilderness. Uh, remember those days when Jacob served for a spouse? What are you going to go back to those days? Days of being deceived, days of being poor, days of sleepless nights and all that Jacob had to go through. You need to go back to where you came from and then you will hopefully remember that I am God and I have always been your saviour. And at the end of this part of the lawsuit, again, uh, almost as if three times establishes the deal, Israel is to be welcomed back. Chapter 14, uh, verses 9, 1 to 9. O Israel, Hosea says, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses, nor we say any more to the work of our hands. You are our gods, for in you the fatherless finds mercy. 
And then God replies, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. For my anger has turned away from him. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. And that's a picture of the cedar of Lebanon, the tree um, with, with very long roots. His branches shall spread. He's beautiful be like an olive tree. His fragrance like Lebanon. And those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall be revived like grain and grow like a vine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, what have I to do any more with idols? I have heard and observed him. I am like a green cypress tree. Your fruit is found in me. Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know him. For the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble. And so the language here is quite interesting. Because how are Israel ultimately to be restored? If we look at these three returns, God is calling them to himself. Um, God is saying, how can I give you up? But at the end, they come back. At the end of the book, they come back. How do they come back? Well, they come back through prayer and repentance. Uh, if you look at verse 1 uh, and 2, it says, Israel, return to the Lord God, for you stumbled because of your iniquity. You're sinners. You, you've fallen in sin. You've fallen in iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Well, that's prayer, isn't it? If you're going to become uh, back to the Lord, you have to come with prayer. Take words, he cries. And the language of, of verses uh, 2, uh, uh, really, is, is that of Psalm 51, isn't it? You know, this, this repentance, penitent language. And, uh, you know, and Israel says, uh, what have I to do any more with idols? I'm going to leave that old life behind. I'm going to return to the Lord. Uh, Syria couldn't save us even if they wanted to. It is only God who can save and so at the end, we have this hope uh, and have this picture that Israel uh, will return to the Lord. Although, of course, as we've said to you already, this is against the backdrop of Hosea watching Israel being taken away. There was a three-year siege of Samaria, like there was in Elisha's time, but this time God didn't uh, free them. The uh, city was overthrown, the people were taken away, and Hosea the prophet watches all of this happening. So what can we learn from the book of Hosea? Uh, it's clearly not an easy read. Um, it's, a, it's a work of great poetry. I mean, uh, the imagery is striking. You know, God is likened to a jealous husband, but he's also likened to a frustrated shepherd. He's likened to a destructive moth, uh, which I thought that was interesting. You know, Jesus talks about the moth, doesn't he, himself? Uh, he's likened to an undesired rot. He's likened to a roaring lion. Again, we have that. A phrase he's also likened to a trapper but on a more positive note god is also pictured as the healing physician reviving reigns a loving parent a protecting lion life giving giving to you and a fertile pine tree this is called imagery of the cedar tree here israel on the other hand is likened to an unfaithful uh, wife a silly dove a hot ovens uh, in other words, you have this phrase, you know, that Israel is a, is a cake half turned. You know, you burnt one side, you kind of cold the other. He's a faulty bow, he's a wild donkey. God's judgment upon Israel is likened to a whirlwind, to washing away of debris and the yoking of a reluctant heifer. But most important image that comes out of this book of Hosea is that this picture of the husband and the wife. Uh, the sweet innocent passionate longing that we find in the song of solomon is now a caricature of that in hosea it's the dark side of a marriage where there's been unfaithfulness there's been ingratitude there's been betrayal and much sorrow and yet the lord doesn't give her up he buys her back and so we have here a picture of the church don't we the picture of the bride of christ once dead in trespasses and sins and if you read ephesians 2 paul doesn't pull any punches about that you know he doesn't say you were a basically a nice people that, that god has let into heaven he says you're dead in your trespasses and your sins you're like the people of hosea's time there's nothing good in you nothing to for god to desire you but christ has brought you back once you were not a people now you are a people 
Once you are utterly unlovely, unfaithful, rebellious, willful, dreadfully sinful, but Christ has brought us back. You know, remember the phrase that Paul uses in Corinthians, you know, uh, where he talks about all of these, you know, vices. And he says, such were some of you. Yeah, you were like this. But Christ has brought you back. And so reading Hosea, it shows us the depth of our sins, the great need we have of salvation, and it shows the great love of God for his people, that love that never changes, the love that in, in made him pay a terrible price to get his people back. So Hosea also shows the depths from which we have been raised to life, and therefore there's no room for boasting. And this is still the plague of the churches, isn't it? That we as Christians are very quick to think we are better than we really are. We're quick to boast, we're quick to seek the highest place, and what we are is utterly unworthy of Christ's love. But Hosea shows us uh, the depth of Christ's love and the sinfulness of sin. Secondly, the book of Hosea tells us that we're chosen by grace. It's quite clear that Gomer, this woman, was not chosen for her purity or her virtue or stability or anything like that. She was chosen because she was chosen, and so are we. The hymn says we're debtors to mercy alone. One man writes, we're less worthy to be the bride of Christ than Gomer was to be the bride of Hosea. And yet, God says in Hosea, I drew you with cords of love, Calvary love. Uh, and so the second lesson of Hosea is that we must be a grateful people. We must be a thankful people. Uh, as I said already, there's a lot of language that is parallel in, in Hosea and in Romans 1. But if you notice in Romans 1, what Paul says uh, is where sin always starts. Sin always starts, according to Romans 1, with thanklessness. Once we start to be thankless people, once we start to be ungrateful people, we always begin to be a sinful people. Paul writes, because they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. This is Israel in Hosea's time, as well as us, as Gentiles. Neither were thankful. And so when you and I stop being thankful to God, we are on the slippery slope of sin. So we must always remember that. We must always be a thankful people. But the story of Hosea is that when we repent, God forgives. And that's the story of uh, the New Testament, isn't it? You know, 1 John tells us you know, that if we repent of our sins, we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Jesus uh, says uh, to uh, his people in his day, he says, go and read what this means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. In that comment, Jesus shows the limits of the law but the limitlessness of his grace. And then perhaps above all, Hosea deals with this very tricky uh, subject of the backslider. I mention this because you may not uh, agree with me, but it's quite clear, I think, that uh, Goma and uh, Israel were backsliders. You know, uh, how do we get that? Well, um, look at the parable of the uh, prodigal son. Or the lost son. You see, he starts off in the parable as the son. So he does belong to God. But then he leaves. Goes off to a far country. You know, spends all his money with harlots and all the rest of it. And then, at that point, he is dead. He's back in his old ways. He's a backslider. But then he comes to himself. And he's now alive again. All right? the, the father says of the son... This is my son who was dead, but is now alive. This is my son, belongs to me, part of the kingdom. If we use kingdom language, gone off, but he's now back again. Can the backslider be restored? Hosea tells us the backslider can be restored. Why? Because God's love for us never changes. Not that there weren't consequences for Israel, there were because they were taken away into captivity, and that would have been hor horrendous. There was consequences for the prodigal son. He had no inheritance. He would have had to work for the rest of his life rather than live to the standard that he would have uh, expected as the son of this, this obviously wealthy man. And there are always lessons for us uh, it to learn if we backslide. David with Bathsheba and Uriah. Uh, you know, yes, he was forgiven, but the sword never departed from his house. 
So this is not a message which says we can go away and sin and it's all fine because that's not what the book of Hosea teaches. Neither is the story of David in that instance. If we sin, if we backslide, there are consequences, but we can be forgiven and we can be restored. And so we need to bear that in mind uh, uh, for one another as well. If someone sins in the congregation, yes, they have to, to face the discipline of the church, but they can and should be restored. And so the, the message of Hosea ends on, on, a, on a high note, really. All who are thirsty may come and drink from the wells of salvation. Uh, this is the lesson of Hosea, uh, who in an unlikely way becomes then a prophet of grace. Well, I hope that was uh, useful and uh, a brief look at the book of Hosea. Amen.